uh, we are, believe it or not, halfway through Social Ontology 2021. I know that it's been a stretch for many of you. I want to thank you all for your continued participation and attendance. And uh, yeah, it's been great so far. And I'd like to introduce uh, Carolina Sartorio. She's a, prof a professor of philosophy at the University of Arizona. She works on causation, agency, free will, moral responsibility, and uh, a host of other issues that intersect metaphysics, the philosophy of action, and uh, moral theory. And in her 2016 book entitled uh, Causation and Free Will, she develops a view of free will that draws on the metaphysics of causation and on the relationship between causation and moral responsibility. And today she'll be speaking on causal contributions and responsibility. So without further ado, I turn it over to her. Thank you, Sada. Thank you for having me. And uh, well, thank you all for coming uh, on a Sunday afternoon or evening or whatever time of the day it is for you guys. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so is this good for everybody? Can people see? Okay. Um, yeah, so like Sada said, I work mostly um, at the intersection of metaphysics, agency, and ethics. And uh, it's an intersection that I find particularly fruitful. I'm uh, in particular interested in how certain metaphysical issues bear on ethical questions, such as questions about moral responsibility and uh, liability and concepts of that kind. And this talk is partly based on um, a paper that came out in a special issue of the Journal of Applied Philosophy last year as part of a symposium on um, causation and the ethics of war. And, um, and then further discussions that uh, ensued uh, after that the publication of the special issue. And the origin of the problem was a striking difference in how ethicists and metaphysicians conceive of the concept of cause as applied to certain debates or just in general. Um, so, in a series of conferences that I attended or workshops on, on the ethics of self-defense and war, I discovered that ethicists and applied ethicists uh, sometimes make use of a graded concept of causal contribution or a graded concept of cause, something being more or less of a cause of something else. And they, uh, make use of that important assumption in their theories of, um, in the ethics of self-defense, in the ethics of unjust war, for example. Metaphysicians, on the other hand, for the most part, tend to assume that causation is an on-off matter, that either something is a cause of an effect or it isn't, and that there aren't any degrees of cause or of causal contributions. So if you think about some classical views of causation, such as the original view proposed by David Lewis in terms of counterfactual dependence, that is an example of an on-off view of uh, cause. And if you think about uh, another classical view, such as Mackey's, view in terms of regularities or lawful sufficiency or being an, uh, a, a, min, a part of a minimally sufficient condition for an effect, that's also an on-off uh, proposal. 
on what causation is. On the other hand, it seemed to me that when I was reading these papers in applied ethics that uh, they were really trying to talk about the same concept of cause. So at least that's the impression that I got. I'd be curious to hear if you know about these debates, what you think about that question, whether they're really trying to capture the same concept, roughly speaking. So the structure of the talk is, first, I'm gonna start by giving you some motivation for thinking in general that there might be such degrees of causal contribution. So the motivation for thinking of causation as a graded concept, the way I see it, although I reject it, how I think uh, people who believe in degrees of causal contribution might be thinking about it. Then I'm going to briefly explain uh, my argument against it, which is again, partly taken from the paper in that special issue. Um, then uh, also as kind of as part of that argument, uh, I try and explain away the appearance or the appearances, because there's different kinds of appearances that causation comes in degrees. And that has to be done in different ways, depending on the type of case you're thinking about. And then finally, I'll end with potential implications of my main conclusion. All right. So here's one thing you might think. Moral responsibility, in particular, moral responsibility for outcomes, things that happen out there in the world as a result of what we do or fail to do, de uh, it depends on what we contribute to those outcomes. So there's this important link between causal contribution and moral responsibility when thinking about responsibility for outcomes. However, moral responsibility seemingly comes in degrees. So there's many examples of this phenomenon or alleged phenomenon. Uh, so you might think of cases where some agents seem to be more morally responsible than others, than other agents for the same outcome in question. Or you might think about cases where agents are more responsible than other factors that are not agents, something like facts of the circumstances. Um, and here's a list of possible examples, there could be others of what you might have in mind. So um, when you're thinking about the contribution that a principle of a crime makes to the crime versus a mere accomplice, it might uh, seem like the principal is making a larger contribution, which uh, makes it more morally responsible. When you're thinking about the role that officers versus soldiers have in a war, say, you might think of something similar, combatants versus non-combatants or civilians, actions versus omissions of agents, perhaps. And then I said, there are also cases where you're comparing the contribution of an agent to the contribution of something that is not an agent. So imagine that uh, there's this very drunk driver who got involved in an accident in the middle of a storm and that both the agents being drunk and the storm contributed to the accident. However, it might be that the agent was so drunk that we might want to say that drunkenness con contributed more than the storm itself. Okay, so the central question then that I'm uh, interested in here is whether those degrees of moral responsibility could be traced back to or grounded in degrees of causal contribution. So is there a way of making sense of a graded notion of cause that could potentially 
serve as grounds for the degrees of responsibility that we see in these cases. Okay, so my answer is gonna be no, right? But um, hopefully already by thinking about these cases, you might be thinking, well, there's something to be said for that idea. I mean, in other examples, um, it might be that the degrees of moral responsibility are grounded in other kinds of differences, right? So uh, it might be that um, an agent has a worse intention in one case than in the other, or is more certain that, that uh, they would be causing harm. Does the difference in responsibility can be grounded in an epistemic difference or a difference in intentions. So that's not what I have in mind here. Um, so what um, the people that I have in mind have been thinking is that in some cases, the difference in responsibility can be traced back specifically to a difference in degree of causal contribution. Everything else might be held the same and we still see a difference in responsibility. It must be then that that difference is due to a difference in causal contribution. Of course, um, as you can imagine, the answer to that question is likely to have important implications for moral theory and applied ethics, for example, the ethics of self-defense and just war. But also I take it, it might potentially have implications for legal responsibility as well, to the extent that you think legal responsibility is grounded or can be grounded in causal contributions. So if there's a graded no notion of causal contribution, that might also result in, or that might also ground degrees of legal responsibility as a result. Okay, so the next main thing uh, is gonna be my argument that there are no degrees of causal contribution, that this is all a big confusion or an illusion. But before we get to that, let me explain just a couple of assumptions that, I'll, that I'm making in this talk. Uh, so we're thinking about degrees of causal contribution that can potentially ground degrees of moral responsibility for outcomes. So of course that presupposes that we can be morally responsible for outcomes and not just for attempts, say, that, uh, uh, that result in some cases in those outcomes uh, coming about. Now, how exactly we make sense of that idea is not something that, that's really relevant for my purposes, but it has to be a legitimate application of the concept of moral responsibility. And then the other main thing I wanna mention is that when I speak of causal contribution, as I said, I'm interested in the metaphysical concept of causal contribution that I think underlies all these debates so what I have in mind is a natural concept, something like a, a natural relation out there in the world that relates events or facts of certain kinds, but it's also a quite broad concept. So what I have in mind is that um, I assume a concept of causal contribution that can apply to cases involving uh, in particular omission. So omissions or negative actions, if you want, or negative behaviors can causally contribute in the relevant sense to outcomes. And also in cases of overdetermination, when there's more than one sufficient um, potential cause for an effect, but I also mean symmetric overdetermination when all of the sufficient causes are on a par. So it's not the case that one of them is preempted by the others. So the reason that I want to use this broad concept of contribution is that 
of course, there's a huge debate in metaphysics about how exactly we should understand the causal structure or the structure of those cases. However, that debate is irrelevant for our purposes here because there's clearly some sense in which we wanna say omissions can contribute so to outcomes. An outcome can come about because of, at least partly, because of what you didn't do, not just because of what you did. And also in cases of symmetric overdetermination, the outcome comes about um, because of the overdeterminants, right? Perhaps only collectively, but clearly they contribute something to the outcome coming about. Right? All of them do if, if this is a symmetric overdetermination case. So that's the concept of causal contribution that I have in mind. Um, how exactly to understand that contribution will depend on what you think about these debates. So if you think, for example, emissions are causes, and if you think overdeterminers are individual causes, this is just standard causation, right, in all of these cases. But you don't have to think uh, that way. So um, some people don't believe omissions can be causes, but they still think that omissions can contribute to outcomes in other kinds of ways. So Phil Dow has this proposal that involves this concept of quasi-causation that combines actual with counterfactual causation, basically. And then other people have a concept of causal explanation in mind. So omissions can still explain, even if they don't cause or bring about an outcome. And for overdetermination, it might be that overdeterminers are not in the individual causes, but collectively they are, right? So all of these can be contributors in my sense. I think the answer to our central question do causal contributions come in degrees, shouldn't really hinge on any of these debates, right? So that question is still going to arise regardless of what we think about these metaphysical debates. All right. So um, one more thing before we get to the argument. Um, this is one of four poison examples that I'll be using, but they're all very simple. So uh, don't worry, it should be pretty straightforward and easy to follow. But this is one main example that I wanna start out with because again, this is a case that can be used to motivate the idea that contributions come in degrees. So imagine that there are these two agents, A and B, who want a victim dead and um, in order for the victim to die as a result of ingesting the contents of this bottle, there have to be at least 100 drops of a certain poison in the bottle. And A contributes 99 and B contributes only one. But other things are equal. So this is important so that we can really isolate the uh, potential significance of degrees of causal contribution from other potentially relevant factors relevant to their moral responsibility. So imagine that everything else is equal as far as the intentions of the agents, as far as the beliefs of the agents. So one thing you can imagine is, for example, that they both believe that they're doing whatever it is that's required or uh, and sufficient for bringing about the death of the person. Right, and they have no idea about what the other person is doing or is going to do later on, right? So each one of them acts with a really evil intention, thinking that they're going to bring about the deaths on their own, right? So the only difference is that A contributes 99 drops because that's what she thinks is necessary and B contributes only one. So there's an appearance here, I guess, um, I, uh, assuming you share this impression that A contributes more than B does to victim's death in this case. 
Okay, so. In order to build the argument again, so we first have to think about um, how people have tried to put this into, to, to incorporate the idea of degrees of causal contribution into their theories. So again, this is gonna be quite brief. I hope this is enough to understand the main idea behind these proposals. So most theories of causation involve a concept of sufficiency of some kind and, and or a concept of necessity of some kind, some, uh, typically some combination of the two. So we're gonna see uh, sufficiency making an appearance and then necessity making an appearance. So one thing you can do to incorporate degrees of causal contribution into your theory of causation is you take either sufficiency or necessity, you turn them into graded notions or you pick a notion of sufficiency or necessity that is graded, and then you use that to build your theory of causation on that basis. So the very rough idea that I'll be working with is that according to this sufficiency proposal, you're taking sufficiency to be the relevant measure. So the extent of a cause's contribution on this view depends on how close the cause comes to being a sufficient condition for the effect. The idea being that, I mean, no cause is typically enough by itself. You always need background circumstances and other conditions. However, there's a difference uh, between conditions that come much closer to being sufficient by themselves and conditions that um, don't come quite as, close, quite as close. So Alex Kaiserman in particular has proposed that this can be understood in terms of probability raising. I'm mostly going to be working with that proposal here for this efficiency measure. So I'm gonna illustrate with the drunk driver case where remember there's this drunk driver um, in a storm, both of them, drunkenness and the storm contributed to the accident but the driver was so drunk that we wanna say being drunk contributed more, right? So this is a case where both contributed, but intuitively being drunk contributed more. And this is his proposal on how to understand this by appeal to probability racing or probabilities. This is in terms of objective probabilities. So he suggests, um, the objective probability that the crash would occur given the drunk state is larger than the probability that it would occur given the storm. Um, and I think one easy way to picture this is the way he does it in terms of possible worlds or ranges of possible worlds. There are more drunk worlds, worlds where the agent is drunk, than storm worlds, worlds where there is a storm. Um, that are also crash worlds. So the crash happens in more worlds uh, where the agent is drunk than in worlds where the agent, sorry, where the agent is driving in a storm, but is not drunk. Um, and this is supposed to capture the idea that if the driver was very, very drunk, then any number of potential counterfactual circumstances would have led to the crash many more circumstances than the storm, okay? Okay, so that's all you really need to know. Hopefully that example helps. So we'll leave it there for the time being. However, like I said, uh, necessity is another um, important concept that plays a role in theories of causation. And you might think of appealing to a necessity measure instead of, or in addition to a sufficiency measure, like the one that Kaiserman proposed. So um, here the idea is that 
uh, instead of saying the extent of your contribution, how much of the cause you are, how much you contribute depends on how close you come to being sufficient, you say it depends on how close you come to being necessary for the effect in the relevant sense. Now, the relevant sense is typically taken to be, uh, it's not logical necessity, of course, or anything like that, because no causes meet that condition. But something like counterfactual dependence, which captures a very natural concept of difference making. So Joplin and Halpern have proposed a theory of graded um, causal contributions that does precisely this. So I'm going to, again, illustrate with one main example. Hopefully that will be enough to give you an idea. I think it's a very intuitive idea. So when you think about um, elections, right, and how heavily overdetermined they tend to be, there's still an important difference, typically, between large elections and smaller elections, right? So large elections tend to be much more heavily overdetermined simply because it involves a much larger population of voters than a smaller election. So take a federal election, a large election, um, and compare it with a local election where both outcomes were overdetermined, but as predicted, the outcome of the federal election was a lot more heavily overdetermined than the outcome of the local election. So what they suggest is that um, the necessity measure can account for the appearance that your vote contributes more in a smaller election because it makes more of a difference, even if it doesn't really make a difference, right? All things considered, because the outcome was overdetermined. Um, and the idea is again that it's less overdetermined. And one way to see that is you start imagining changes in the actual votes, right? And um, with a federal election, you would have to make a lot more changes than with a local election, given that the outcome was much more overdetermined. Okay, well, I hope that's enough to give you a sense of the proposals out there. So again, the sufficiency idea is that yeah. degrees of causation are measured by appeal to how much you raise the probability of an outcome occurring, right? Uh, compared to other things. And the necessity idea appeals to this uh, apparent significance of overdetermination and how much of a difference you make. And of course, there could be proposals that combine both of them in some way or other. So the argument is that, well, at least this is one way of giving an argument for my uh, main thesis, which is that this is all a big confusion. Um, it involves appealing to a particular puzzle that arises once you realize that both the sufficiency measure and the necessity measure um, seem to have at least some plausibility if there are degrees of causal contribution, right? So if there were degrees of causal contribution, they could be measured in this way or they could be measured in this other way. So one way to formulate the argument then is as a puzzle and then arguing that the best solution to the puzzle is to, in fact, reject the initial assumption that causal contributions come in degrees. There's other ways, and uh, towards the end, when I get to explaining the way the appearances, you'll see um, that part of my idea is that what appear to be measures of causal contribution, of degrees of causal contribution, can better can best be seen as either measures of something else, degrees of something else, not degrees of actual causal contribution, or as something else altogether. Right. So that's that's going to be part of the proposal. Okay. Um, 
So the argument is very simple. Uh, the puzzle arises once you change the details of the poison example a little bit. So I'm introducing two other poison examples here. Remember with poison one, um, what we had was that um, um, 100 drops were needed and A contributed 99 and B contributed only one. With poison two, you still have the, the 100 were needed, but A and B each contributed 50 drops. So we're making their contributions the same. This is another case of uh, what's typically called joint causation. There's no over-determination, right? So each one of them contributes part of what's required. And now in poison three, you turn it into an over-determination case. So instead of assuming that 100 drops were needed, you assume only 50 were needed where again, A and B each contribute enough because they contribute 50. So that's an over-determination case. So that's a very simple way of getting the puzzle going. Um, it's not really important that we have A and B, it's just that I wanna make it parallel to poison one. <laughs> so what we're really comparing here or trying to compare is the contribution that each makes in each case with the contribution that they make in the other case, right? So think about this for a minute. In which case do you think A or B contributed more, or maybe they contributed the same, you think? If there are degrees of causal contribution, where do they make a larger contribution? In poison two, where each one of them provided something that was required without which the outcome wouldn't have happened. Or in poison three, where each one of them provided something that was sufficient for the outcome to happen. So that's the question. So I find this really puzzling. I, I find an argument for going one way just as persuasive or not as persu not persuasive at all as the other argument in the other direction. Um, so personally, I'm at complete loss, loss as to how to answer this question. What's going on here is that we have a conflict between the two criteria that we talked about before sufficiency and necessity. So in poison two, that was the joint causation case, the two causes are higher uh, on the necessity measure, but lower on the sufficiency measure. But in poison three is the other way around, right? They're both sufficient, but not necessary because it's an over-determination case. So they're higher in the sufficiency measure, but lower in the necessity measure. So when you have a conflict like this, it's uh, unclear which way to go or what to say, if to say that they make an equal contribution or, or perhaps we can't say which makes a larger contribution, perhaps there's some indeterminacy. Or another way to go is to say that this was all a confusion, right? And that's my view. My view is that this puzzle can help us see that this was all a confusion, that such comparisons don't make any sense at all. So um, the whole view is that causation is or causing is an on-off relation. What is causation? But here I try to be as neutral as I possibly can on what causation is. Um, it's very roughly something like coming together with other causes and right? so other factors to provide what's required or what's minimally required given the natural laws. Um, so that's all causation is. So either you do that or you don't, right? Now there are other concepts in the vicinity that can still be gradable, 
and I'm going to suggest that in a second. And uh, moreover, uh, this appearance that causation comes in degrees that we talked about before and that we illustrated with some examples, I argue can be explained away, at least for the most part, perhaps in different ways, in different cases. And part of the explanation is going to appeal to this idea that there are other concepts in the neighborhood that are gradable. It's just not the concept of actual causal contribution. Okay. So the next part is the part where I say, why did it seem so natural in some of these cases that we talked about to think that causation came in degrees, that there are degrees of causal contribution. And remember one main example we talked about was poison one. In poison one, 100 drops were needed. A contributed more, it seemed, than B, because A contributed 99 drops and B contributed only one. So in this case, or this type of case, I think there's at least two strategies that can be used. Maybe you guys can come up with others if you wanna help me here to explain away that, that appearance. So strategy number one would be to say that at least in that type of case, in addition to the main outcome we're interested in, which is the outcome of the victim's death, of course, there's another outcome in the vicinity, uh, which is something like the total number of poison or drops of poison in the bottle, right? The fact that there is 100 uh, drops of poison in the bottle. So call that O1 and then call the death O2, outcome two. So my proposal is that O1 is a, a type of outcome, not all outcomes are like this, that can be decomposable into smaller bits in obvious ways, right? So if the total number of poison drops is 100, then that can be decomposed into all the different drops that um, add up to the 100. But the death is just on off, right? So either the victim dies or the victim doesn't die. So maybe one thing that's going on here is that we clearly do wanna say if we distinguish between these two outcomes, that both A and B caused O1, right? Because they both contributed to there being 100 drops of poison in the bottle, which then caused O2, right? The fact that there were 100 drops of poison in the bottle brought about the death. But of course, A, given that A contributed 99, caused a larger part of that outcome than B, simply because 99 drops is more than just one drop. So one thing that might be going on here is that we're confusing uh, degrees of causal contribution with decomposable outcomes, right? Um, and we're conflating, making a larger contribution to an outcome that is not decomposable with making a larger contribution to a decomposable outcome. But there's another thing that could be said in connection with this type of case, which I think works in many more scenarios than the first strategy. It's appealing to general powers of um, things or behaviors or actions. So another thing that could be said is that what we're conflating in this case is actual contributions of actions or behaviors with general powers of actions or behaviors. So what we do makes, of course, actual contributions to outcomes, but it also has more general powers to contribute to a range of outcomes or to types of outcomes. Right, so the general causal powers of behaviors, I suggest, 
go beyond the actual manifestations of the powers. Uh, just like you might have uh, solubility or fragility, right? Not manifesting in specific circumstances, but the things in question still have the relevant general powers. So of course, contributing 99 drops of a poison of a certain kind is much more generally harmful than contributing only one drop of that same poison. Because you can conceive of a larger type of range of situations where 99 drops of that poison will do harm, a lot more harm than uh, the, the, the single drop of poison. And again, there's a, an analogy with, uh, in this case, I have fragility here. A champagne glass is fragile. An ordinary glass is fragile. But a champagne glass is more fragile in the general sense. It has the power of fragility to a larger extent, and that's a general power, than the ordinary glass, roughly, because it breaks under a larger range of circumstances. So the same can be said, of course, of contributing 99 drops of poison versus contributing just one. That's the thought. So perhaps that's what's going on in this case, or, or that's part of what's going on, that we are conflating the general powers of what A and B are doing with the actual manifestation or with the actual contribution that they're making. So this is just a slide where I tell you, uh, and by the way, in the literature on dispositions, people have done this. People have come up with accounts of gradable dispositions understood in this general sense. So Manley and Wasserman have done that. They have even appealed to range of ranges of possible worlds, uh, worlds where the object manifests manifest the disposition when subjected to the relevant stimulus. And the proposal is roughly that, uh, say, an object is more fragile when it breaks in a larger range of possible worlds of that kind. So there's a, there's a very close analogy here between those proposals and how to cash out uh, this graded concept of dispositions and the probability-based account uh, that appeals to the sufficiency measure that we talked about before. Because they both do it in terms of ranges of possible worlds. Okay, so I said that I think the second strategy can be used to account for other appearances. Um, and the first strategy can be used to account for other appearances as well, but not as many, perhaps. So in the case of uh, the drunk driver and the storm, you could say something similar, right? You could say being very drunk while driving has the general potential to cause serious harm more than the storm itself. Um, and in the election example, you can say a vote in a small election has more general potential to be the decisive vote than in a larger election. So all of this might be uh, part of what's going on, uh, the fact that we're conflating actual contributions with uh, general powers. And uh, the election example can also be cashed out in terms of decomposable outcomes, at least part of it, right? So when you're thinking about how many votes are needed to win an election, something like that, and you, you think about how a vote in a smaller election can contribute to a larger part of that uh, required outcome, right? So to the extent that it's quantifiable in some way, we can still appeal to the um, decomposable outcome strategy. I'm going to say a little bit more about Kaiserman's proposal now that we talked about general powers in particular. So when you think about his proposal, recall his proposal was that 
uh, the extent of the causal contribution that a cause makes can be measured by appeal to probability raising and in particular by appeal to um, how much the cause raises the probability, which can be cashed out in terms of ranges of possible worlds. What he's doing in, in fact is he's combining two things in a way that seems to be unmotivated to me. So on the one hand, of course, he recognizes that general powers by themselves are not enough to make a causal contribution. So sometimes you make it, sometimes you don't. However, general powers by themselves are, on his view, enough, once you make a causal contribution, to determine the extent of your contribution. So why would that be that, causal, that general powers are not enough by themselves to determine whether you make a contribution? But then once you do, it turns out that you do make a contribution, they are enough by themselves to determine the extent of your contribution. So this is the combination that, that he's using, right? Uh, so the extent of your contribution is measured by the general powers Right, instead of just features about actual contributions. Right, but first you have to make a contribution in the first place. And then how much of a contribution you make is measured on his view simply by the general powers. Why isn't it better to say that what's actually gradable is the general powers, right? And not the actual causal contribution. So general powers are gradable, but that doesn't mean that uh, actual contributions inherit that great ability, right? Actual contributions are just actual contributions. Sometimes those powers manifest, sometimes they don't. When they don't, you don't make a contribution. When they do, you make a contribution, but that's all there is. And then another thing I want to say about his view, when I talk about his view because I find it really interesting and it's one of the most um, plausible views of degrees of contribution, I think, um, is that, well, of course, when he says, when he uses sufficiency, right, um, he um, recognizes that the relevant notion of sufficiency is always sufficiency in the circumstances. So we have to somehow take out the background circumstances. We have to single out those facts of the circumstances that we're going to hold fixed somehow. Um, and then that's going to help us determine what the contribution of the cause really is. So there's this antecedent step of um, singling out the, the background circumstances. Now, what we regard as those background circumstances will, of course, depend on the context and it will depend on our interests. So imagine now I'm going back to poison one, right? So 100 drops are needed, A contributes 99 and B contributes one. Imagine now a version of that case, a variant on that case, where the 99 drops are not contributed by an agent at all, but by some natural phenomenon. Uh, in his talk, Gunnar had a waterfall <laughs> uh, that contributes water into, a, I don't remember what it was, but some bucket or something. Um, so here you have to imagine like a poison waterfall, right? So the 99 drops are there due to this natural process. And now you think about the contribution that B makes. Remember that 100 drops are needed, 99 are not enough. So doesn't B's contribution seem a lot larger in that case once we switch to an example that doesn't involve another agent? Because now it's like he's carrying all the weight as an agent. But of course, if what we have in mind is a natural concept of cause or of causal contribution, where the other 99 drops are coming from should not make a difference. I don't think they do make a difference 
to the actual contribution that B makes. The actual contribution that B makes should be the same, right? Because he does exactly the same thing uh, in both cases. And in both cases, there's 99 other drops that are coming from another source. And whether that other source is agential or not should not matter to the causal contribution that B makes. So I think what this uh, suggests basically is that our intuitions about degrees of causation in these cases really depend, seem to depend on very, um, depending on factors that are completely irrelevant to causation. So they're, they're kind of unreliable, right? The fact that we can um, play with our intuitions in this way to me is another, yet another reason to think that we shouldn't trust these appearances. I'm almost done. So I have uh, just a discussion of a different kind of appearance altogether that cannot be accounted for in the same terms. So, so far we talked about these two strategies of appealing to decomposable outcomes and appealing to general powers. But how about a quite simple appearance that traces back to exploiting the necessity measure instead of exploiting the sufficiency measure? Poison one, remember, has to do with more with sufficiency than with necessity. So one last poison example. This is very, very simple. So in poison four, all I'm assuming is there were 50 drops required and A contributed them all. Okay, so A contributed the 50. There's no second agent, there's no B. So it's a simple causation case. And I wanna compare it with poison three, where 50 were needed again, um, and A and B each contributed 50 drops. All right, so that was the over-determination case. So if you focus on A's contribution, in poison three and poison four, A contributes 50 drops in both cases, but in poison four, um, there's no overdetermination. Those 50 drops were required, but in poison three, there's overdetermination. So the 50 drops contributed by B would have been enough by themselves. So there's a, a different type of appearance here but that also seems to suggest quite strongly that A contributes more in poison four because of the overdetermination in poison three. Right? And that cannot be accounted for in terms of general powers because they both contribute 50 drops in each case. And I think it cannot be accounted for in terms of decomposable outcomes either. So it's, it has a different source and this is my suggestion. Again, if you have other suggestions, I'd be curious to hear them. We can skip this. So maybe what's going on here is that we are conflating degrees of causal contribution with grounds, with the existence of more reasons or grounds for thinking that there is causation or perhaps with the existence of more direct grounds for causation or reasons for thinking there's causation. So the main difference between the two cases is that there is counterfactual dependence in one case, but not in the other, because there's no overdetermination in one case, but there is overdetermination in the other. And counterfactual dependence is typically taken to be uh, sufficient for causation. So, if you make a difference to the outcome's occurrence, in the sense that the outcome wouldn't even have occurred if you hadn't done your part, then that seems to be enough. It is a bit rough, but roughly that's the idea, uh, for thinking that you made a contribution. And so it's not necessary because of overdetermination cases in particular, but it's at least sufficient. So maybe all that's going on in this last case is that 
we have that much more direct route to causation in the one case where there is no overdetermination and we don't in the other case. So when you have an overdetermination case, remember that I'm assuming this broad concept of contribution. So I'm assuming you make a contribution of some kind, um, but first you have to rule out that there's any preemption by the other potential causes. Okay, so I'm assuming there is no such preemption in this case, but it's not automatic, right? So you don't have the counterfactual dependence that would give you that very direct route to thinking that there is causation. Okay, I'm happy to say more about all of these cases in Q and A. Now, if I'm right, what are the practical implications of rejecting degrees of causal contribution? Well, going back to what I said at the beginning, given the link between contributions and responsibility and liability, of course, one important consequence is that we can't ground degrees of responsibility or liability, if we think there are such degrees, in degrees of causal contribution. We're gonna to have to ground them in something else. Um, in particular, we can't ground certain principles such as, for example, a principle that sometimes people talk about is the principle of civilian immunity in the context of war, right, in degrees of causal contribution. We can't say civilians don't make a significant contribution to the war, so we can't kill them for that reason. We can only kill combatants. And then another implication that interests me is the connection with moral responsibility and moral luck, moral luck involving outcomes. So there's this interesting result Right? So if there are no degrees and when A contributes 99 and B contributes one, if they both contribute, that's all we can say, right? At least with respect to the outcome of the victim's death, they both contributed to the victim's death. We can't say A contributed more. So there's a sense in which there seems to be more moral luck, right? And, and that might seem uh, bad at first, perhaps. So what I have in mind is, imagine that you're B and you contributed just the one drop of poison, right? And so now it all depends on whether your drop makes it to, so imagine that, uh, um, imagine a different case where uh, a bunch of people contribute uh, different uh, amounts, right? And you only contributed the one, the single drop. And now whether you're responsible for what happens will depend very heavily on what happens to your single drop of poison. So we would have to trace it back to the outcome and determine whether that single drop of poison was part of the poison that the person drank and so on and so forth. Whereas with the person that contributed 99, there was a much more reliable, of course, route to moral responsibility. So in that sense, it's a bit more fragile even because there is no in-between if there are no degrees of causal contribution. I, I'm not convinced that that is all bad, actually. So, I mean, resultant moral luck is already kind of puzzling. Um, but maybe it shouldn't be that surprising that that's the way it works, right? After all, when you think about result, the paradigm examples of resultant moral luck, uh, for example, uh, the assassin that shoots at a victim and then the bird flies by and intercepts the bullet or deflects the bullet away from its path. And then uh, the victim is not killed, something that's completely outside the agent's control. Um, I'm not convinced that uh, that is a lot better than saying that your responsibility hinges on whether a single drop of poison actually made it to um, the stomach of the person who died as a result of ingesting the poison. 
And also when you think about debates uh, in the ethics of self-defense and war, my intuitions about self-defense are like super uh, liberal, turns out. <laughs> I disagree with everybody about, <laughs> about this. But um, I'm kind of convinced that there are pretty strong independent reasons for not wanting to ground a person's liability in, in that context. So in the context of self-defense, um, that we shouldn't ground it in actual contributions. Uh, whether a person should be or can be killed in self-defense should not hinge just on what the actual contribution is whether the person actually contributed to the threat. Um, may, maybe should be grounded in more general facts, such as what the intentions of the agent were, or the general powers that the agent had and that they decided to use in this case, uh, or maybe other things. But it doesn't strike me as a really bad result that we can't tie it to actual causal contributions. And also, when you think about the puzzle, just to end, I'm ending here. Uh, when you compare it, you compare uh, poison two, I think it was, with poison three, right? That resulted in that puzzle. It seems that we don't know what to say about which agent made a larger contribution. Um, some people might want to say there's incommensurability here. And perhaps. If you're gonna say there's uh, degrees of causal contribution, that is the best thing you could possibly say about that case. Because there's incommensurability in general, perhaps. So maybe this isn't as bad, but when you think about the potential applications of incommensurability to all of these debates, it turns out then that if that is your view, then you're not gonna fare any better if you go for incommensurability than if you just reject degrees of causal contribution altogether. It's gonna be equally disappointing because these puzzles can be easily recreated for combatants and civilians and soldiers and all of that um, because they involve something very, very plain and simple as um, sufficiency and uh, necessity. We can easily think about cases of overdetermination in those contexts and try and compare those contributions to contributions that agents make in other cases. So it's gonna be equally disappointing if you find this disappointing. So just to conclude, I think it's a confusion to think that there are no degrees, so that there are degrees of causal contribution. Um, maybe it's um, a confusion it's more like an illusion that arises from the fact that it's easily conflatable with other concepts. And there could be other things going on here that I haven't really talked about. But the consequences of rejecting contributions, degrees of contribution are not, I think, as disastrous as you might have thought initially. So it isn't all bad. Thanks, that's all I have.